In Isaiah 58 and verse 1, God told the prophet to cry aloud, spare not. In other words, don't hold back no matter who they are. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Don't be timid and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This verse hits on a subject that may not be apparent to some. And you may be surprised as to what the context entails. But the question is, does this message have a modern day application? Are there transgressions and sins among God's professed people today that need to be called out and exposed? And I say absolutely. But anciently, this was a call to Isaiah to be bold enough to call his fellow Israelites to forsake their idols and come back to serve the living God. And here's the main point that many miss. To get back to proper Sabbath observance. That's the context. If you read chapter 57, you'll find that in the course of serving and worshiping idols that can't see or hear, Israel became involved in gross sexual sins. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Our nation just got done celebrating Pride Month. And as you recall, this was the reason God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And don't think that America and the professed church that is derelict in its duty is going to escape being punished for allowing and encouraging these things. Or for just by being silent when the situation calls for someone to cry aloud. The Israelites even sacrificed their own children as burnt offerings to heathen deities. And how much different is that to killing 1,026,700 babies in 2023 here in America through legalized abortion? You know the real reason behind the abortion industry? It's twofold. It's money on the part of those who perform these abortions. And number two, people want to be free to indulge their sexual desires with no consequences. But do you know what was behind Israel's sin and the reason God told Isaiah to cry aloud and spare not? It was the profaning of the Sabbath, which then led to the grosser sins I just mentioned. Do you realize that had the Sabbath always been kept, now think about this, had the Sabbath always been kept as God intended, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to his maker as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. And as this is true, how important must the Sabbath be? It's extremely important, isn't it? You see, when a person forsakes the God of heaven and the commandments that he has given for his people to follow, they get all mixed up and become involved in many different kinds of sins. But the forsaking of the Sabbath was the crux of the problem back then, and it's no different today, because these words apply to God's people in the Christian age as well, and not just to those living during Old Testament times. In other words, there's a work of Sabbath reform to be accomplished in these last days like there was in Isaiah's day. And this reform, just like of old, needs to take place among Sabbath keepers before the Sabbath truth can go out to the world with any positive effect. And this is to happen through the proclamation of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. The everlasting gospel must be presented because God's judgment has begun and a call must be given to God's people who are still in Babylon or a confused religious belief system to come out and join with those who are keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, Jesus had implicit faith in his heavenly father, did he not? Yes, he did. And he wants us to have that same kind of faith in him. God has called me 
and he has called you to cry aloud and spare not and become the repairers of the breach. Notice what it says in Isaiah 56, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah says, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice. Why? For my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. This is speaking of the coming of Jesus to this earth and the sacrifice he would make for sinners. It goes on, Blessed is the man that doeth this, keep judgment and do justice, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Verses 6 and 7. The sons of the stranger, or non-Jews, that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Again, these words apply to the Christian age as shown by the context because these words foreshadow the gathering in of the Gentiles by the gospel. Because notice what verse 8 says, The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather who? Others to him, beside those that are gathered unto him. And so beside the children of Israel, there would be others that would become a part of God's people if they would be willing to obey the God of heaven, take hold of his covenant, and especially keep from polluting the Sabbath. And just as there was a blessing pronounced upon the Israelites for honoring the Sabbath, so these others who would honor the Sabbath would be blessed as well. And so the obligation of the fourth commandment extends past the crucifixion, past the resurrection, and past the ascension of Christ to the time when he returns. Remember what Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom, that is the everlasting gospel, or the first angel's message of Revelation 14, 6, and 7, which has always been the same, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto who? All nations, and then shall the end come. And so very clearly here, the obligation to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy extends down to all peoples and all nations till the end of time. And here's another point we shouldn't overlook. According to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, the seventh day Sabbath was set apart as sacred time at the end of creation week which was 2,500 years before there was a Jewish nation. So don't be thinking the Sabbath was initially given to the Jews, or that it's the Jewish Sabbath, but rather it was given to mankind to observe at the end of creation week and every week thereafter. And not only that, but Isaiah 66, 22 and 23 says, we'll be keeping it in the earth made new. So how does it make sense that the seventh-day Sabbath was the special day of worship in the Old Testament, and we'll be keeping it in the earth made new, but between times it's now the first day of the week. That doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because Sunday sacredness is a man-made institution. And in Matthew 15 and verse 9, Jesus said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16 for a minute and see what it says there. The book of Isaiah is just chucked full of Sabbath instruction. And in verse 16 of chapter 8, notice what God said to Isaiah. He said, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Now here we see that the seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. Why do I say that? It's because of all the ten, the Sabbath command is the only one that mentions the name, the title, and the territory of the lawgiver. And as I've said many times in the past, 
You can keep nine of the commandments and worship a doorknob or any other object you choose because without the fourth one, a person doesn't know who or what they're worshiping. Just as kings and presidents have a seal that describes their name, their title, and their territory, just so only the Sabbath has those three ingredients to show that the Sabbath is God's seal of authority. The Sabbath command is the only one of the ten that tells who we're supposed to worship. His name is Jehovah. His title is Creator. And His territory consists of the heavens and the earth and therefore shows that the Sabbath is His seal and His claim to reverence and worship above all others. And so aside from the fourth commandment, there is nothing in the Decalogue to show by whose authority the law was given. It is an historical fact that when the Sabbath was changed to Sunday by the papacy, and when in 321 A.D. the first Sunday law was introduced back in the days of the Roman Emperor Constantine, the seal, now listen, the seal in the minds of the people was taken away from the law. And isn't that just like Satan to try to do that? After all, didn't he say that he would be like the Most High? And what better way to do that than to trample underfoot the one and only command that points to the true God? By creating a false and spurious day of worship, he's uplifting himself and pointing to his own power as the one who has the authority to change the law, which is the basis of the covenant that the Creator makes with His people. And the thing is, this was foretold many centuries before it happened, because in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, it says that there would come a power that would think to change times, which in the original language means an appointed occasion, and laws can also be translated singularly as commandment. Now tell me, what part of the Ten Commandment law deals with an appointed occasion that deals with time? It's the Sabbath, of course. There are other identifying marks that show conclusively that the papacy did this, and it falls without question at the feet of the Roman power. We don't have time to go into detail this morning, but notice what else it says this power would do besides try to change God's law. Daniel 7.25 says that this power would speak great words against the Most High by usurping His authority and changing His law and would wear out the saints or persecute the saints of the Most High. And they shall be given into His hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. In a previous study, we found that a time represents one year. And times, plural, represents two years, and a dividing of time, a half a year. And when you consider that the calendar they went by back then had 360 days in the year, one year, or one time, would be 360 days. Two years, or two times, would be 720 days, and a half year, or a half a time, would be 180 days. When you add it all up, you get a total of 1,260 days or years using the day-for-year principle when dealing with time prophecy. That the power mentioned in this verse would wear out the saints, and that's exactly what the papacy did for 1,260 years during the Dark Ages. It started in 538 A.D. and ended in 1798 when the Pope was taken captive and put in prison by Napoleon's general, Berthier. This is verified history. And it was quite clever the way the devil usurped God's authority by changing the day of worship by removing the seal of God from the law and replacing it with his own mark, which is Sunday, or the mark of the beast. But as the disciples of Christ, we, just like Isaiah of old, are called upon to restore the seventh-day Sabbath to its rightful position as the Creator's memorial and the sign of his divine authority. Now, since we're in Isaiah chapter 8, let's look at what it says in verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. To the law, the Ten Commandment law, 
and to the testimony or the witness of all the scriptures, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, we have all kinds of conflicting doctrines and theories floating around today, don't we? But the testimony of the scriptures and the law of God, which is the center and heart of it, is the unerring rule by which all opinions, doctrines, and theories are to be tested. When God told Isaiah, cry aloud, spare not, he wasn't telling him to cry out against the wickedness in the world in general, but to lift up his voice like a trumpet against those in Israel that were involved in sin. And because we are told over and over again that the history of ancient Israel is being repeated today in the lives of spiritual Israel, or God's professed church, then this stern rebuke also applies to those who say they are God's special people with a special message, but are also trampling upon the Sabbath, even though they meet on that day. Because there's a lot more to proper Sabbath observance than just meeting together for church, isn't there? Notice what it says in verses 12 to 14 in chapter 8. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of what? Many generations, or of those who have kept the Sabbath in the past. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, in other words, if you quit trampling upon the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. As I already mentioned, the breach or the hole that was made in the law of God, at least in the context of Isaiah 58, was when the observance of the Sabbath was neglected by Israel. But this became a problem later on as well, when afterward the Sabbath was changed by the Roman power. After all this neglect and forgetfulness and downright tampering through the years, the time has come once again for that divine institution to be restored. The gap or the crack in the law is to be repaired, and the foundation of many generations that have honored the Sabbath in the past is to be raised up. That's our work. Let's follow down through the Sabbath-keeping timeline for a few minutes. The Sabbath was first kept by Adam and Eve in their innocence, and also after they fell. It was kept by all the patriarchs, from Abel to Noah, and from Abraham to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. But something happened to the children of Israel while they were in Egyptian bondage. Living in the midst of idolatry while there, they lost much of their knowledge of God's law. They lost the knowledge of those many past generations. But when the Lord delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage, he proclaimed his law to the assembled multitude at the foot of Mount Sinai, that they might know the Creator and the law they were to be governed by. But again, this was not the first time the Sabbath was instituted because it was given to our first parents in Eden. And so from the day it was written in stone at Mount Sinai to this present day, the knowledge of God's law has been preserved in the earth in written form, but before that by word of mouth. And so the Sabbath of the fourth commandment has been kept ever since the beginning of time. As far as the New Testament is concerned, for hundreds of years before the Protestant Reformation, the Waldenses kept the true Sabbath. And there were also churches in Central Africa and among the Armenians in Asia who kept the Sabbath. In fact, the Waldenses copied the scriptures that were forbidden by Rome 
and kept the Sabbath in the Alps of the Piedmont Valleys for nearly a thousand years until the papacy was finally able to hunt them down and kill them like animals. And why did they hunt them down? Because the papacy didn't want them to study the word of God for themselves. Because it exposes their fallacies. And they wanted to make people believe that the Seventh-day Sabbath was a relic of Judaism. And of course, Satan, working through the papacy, didn't want these stalwart Christians to influence others with the truth that God had revealed to them. And so they had to be eliminated. And as the repairs patch up the breach that has been made in the law of God, the Sabbath will become the big issue once again in these last days. You see, if you keep people dumbed down, it's much easier to control them. And that's why, by the way, that it was illegal to teach black slaves to read and write back in the day. And this dumbing down is taking place in the schools of our day by not teaching the students in America about the founding principles of our nation. I dare say that the average person on the street today would flunk a civics test were it given to them. And many have no idea what's in our Constitution and Bill of Rights and the sacrifices that were made to achieve these rights. And when you have a majority of people like that, it's much easier to take away their freedom of speech, their freedom of religion, and their ability to protect themselves against a tyrannical government. And friends, this is taking place right before our eyes today, and many people are completely oblivious that it's happening. Even though the papacy did a good job of trampling underfoot God's holy Sabbath day during the time period of its supremacy during the Dark Ages, there were, hidden in secret places, faithful souls who paid it honor. And even though they were reproached and persecuted for it, a constant testimony has been borne to the unchangeable nature of the law of God and the sacred obligation of the Sabbath of creation ever since. And here's what the Apostle John was inspired to write about all this. And it's presented in the third angel's message of Revelation 14 and verse 12, which will distinguish the true church of Christ at the time of his appearing. Notice what it says there. Here, in these last days, is the patience of the saints, or the cheerful endurance of the holy ones. And God doesn't consider those holy who are deliberately violating any one of his commandments. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And you know what? This message is the last message to be given before the coming of the Lord. Because immediately following the third angel's message, Jesus is seen by the prophet coming in glory to reap the harvest of the earth. The pioneers of the Advent faith after 1844 who received the light on the sanctuary in heaven and the immutability or the permanent character of God's law were filled with absolute joy as they saw the beauty and harmony of the system of truth that opened to their understanding. Can you imagine? Especially after the disappointment they suffered when Jesus didn't come as expected. Have you ever felt the joy that comes after you've discovered a certain truth? I remember so clearly the joy I felt when I accepted Christ into my life and the various truths I learned about the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the fallacy of an eternally burning hell, and the non-immortality of the soul and all the promises in God's Word. And I wanted to tell everybody I met about these things. But it didn't take me very long to find out that everybody didn't want to listen. And you know, that's the way it was with the Advent believers when they discovered that there is a sanctuary in heaven where Jesus ministers in our behalf. And inside the ark in the most holy place were the Ten Commandments. And the same Sabbath that was written upon tables of stone was still etched in the ones up there. You can read that in Revelation eleven nineteen, And guess what? The fourth commandment that is written up there is just like the one that was given to Moses by the hand of God. 
Nothing has changed. As you can imagine, when the people that discovered these things had a desire to share that light which appeared so precious to them, and that it might be imparted to all Christians, they couldn't help but believe that it would be as joyfully accepted as it was by them. But something happened that wasn't expected. This newfound truth placed them at variance with the rest of the world and wasn't welcomed by the majority of those who claimed to be the followers of Christ. You see, obedience to the fourth commandment requires a sacrifice from which the majority drew back. And is it any different today? Unfortunately not. And those influenced by Satan have come up with a whole host of false reasons as to why Sabbath observance is no longer required. And so, because the Sabbath is the only command in the ten that's disputed by the various churches today, because they have no problem with the other nine, it becomes the reason that it will be the great test of loyalty in these last days. When this final test comes to fruition, then the line of distinction will be plain for all to see. Are we going to obey God? in just the way he wrote the Ten Commandments on tables of stone with his own finger? Or are we going to observe the false Sabbath in compliance with a coming Sunday law? And friends, there is no reason to doubt that it's not already in the works with the papal climate change agenda, the Christian nationalism movement, the ecumenical movement, the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, and a new one that perhaps you haven't heard of, is something initiated by Pope Francis called the Earth Sabbath Movement. And if we have time today, I'll fill you in on a few more details before we close. When we understand the significance of these things, we will see that it's the observance of the false Sabbath that will be the evidence of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, while the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law will be evidence of loyalty to the Creator. It's just that simple. By accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers regarding this issue, those who go along with it will receive the mark of the beast the mark being enforced Sunday worship, and the beast being the papacy, while those who choose to obey divine authority will receive the seal of God. Because remember, God's seal is in the Sabbath, and therefore Sunday sacredness, as promoted by the papacy, is the mark of its authority, and they've even been so bold as to admit it. And there's plenty of proof to substantiate this claim. Now, what I'm going to do next is especially for those of you who might have doubts about what I've been saying. I want to take the time to promote a certain ministry right now because I'm a firm believer in not trying to reinvent the wheel. What do I mean by that? I mean, I don't need to take the time to do something that someone else has already done and done well. The pastor's name is Joel Laswell. And you can find him on YouTube and Rumble and in a few other places. He has a series of sermons dealing with the papacy and the Sabbath Sunday issue. And he has gone into great detail to show the history of these things. And believe me, once you listen, you will know for certain that these things are so. Get on YouTube and type in Three Angels Sabbath Day Church or do the same on Rumble, and you will find him. I believe he's on part 25 in his series titled The Bold Pretender. And I hope you'll do that if you have any questions at all, and I know you will be blessed. For years now, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message by contrasting the Sabbath Sunday issue have been thought of as people just trying to exaggerate the coming of bad news or as those prophesying calamities all the time. But as the question of making Sunday a day to save the planet by shutting down business one day a week 
and to give families time together and to bring our divided nation back together and encouraging people to get back to God, it's beginning to sound much more plausible that a Sunday law is in the making. Because all these things I just mentioned are already being urged as a solution for the world's ills. And most of them are good things. That's why it's so deceptive. That's how the devil works. He introduces just enough poisonous error with truth so people will accept it unawares. Because it only takes a little poison to kill you. And that's the way it is with falsehood. And by the way, that's how Babylon is defined in the Bible. A mixture of truth and error. And God says, come out of that kind of deception or receive of her plagues. Very soon now, we're going to see that God was right after all and that the day of worship is more important than people have thought. In the very near future, when people are brought to the point of having to decide about the day of worship or suffer the consequences, no doubt many will say, we've always kept Sunday. Our fathers kept it, and many good and pious men have died happy while keeping it. And if they were right, so are we. And you know, it was by these same kinds of arguments that the Jews tried to justify their rejection of Christ. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51, the Bible says that when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was split in two from top to bottom signifying that animal sacrifices and the ceremonial law were no longer necessary or accepted because the death of Jesus was the fulfillment of these things. And to continue on with it is to reject the sacrifice of Christ. But the Jews thought our fathers were accepted by God as they presented their offerings and followed the ceremonial law. And why can't we find salvation by pursuing the same course? And something similar happened during the time of the Protestant Reformation. Those who were loyal to the papacy reasoned that true Christians had died in the Catholic faith, and therefore that religion was sufficient for salvation. But that kind of reasoning became a barrier to keep Catholics in a church where no advancement in religious faith or practice could take place and has kept them in the false system of salvation by works to this day. And so it's not an easy thing to leave the church one has grown up in, but it becomes necessary once the truth becomes known. Now, let me say something about salvation by works, because some of you may get the idea that all this emphasis on Sabbath keeping is just that, salvation by works. But that's not the way it is at all. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are justified by faith and stand before God just as though we'd never sinned. But God looks for obedience once that happens. You see, as Christians, there are a couple errors that we need to guard against. The first one is looking to our own works and trusting to anything that we can do to save ourselves or to bring us into harmony with God. But it's also dangerous to believe that belief in Christ releases us from keeping the law. That since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our salvation. But here's the truth. When we are born again, God writes his law upon the fleshly tables of the heart. As it says in Hebrews chapter 10, 16, Ezekiel 36, 26, and Jeremiah 31, 33. And when that happens, friends, it becomes a delight to do what God says, not drudgery. Don't you think God wants Christians to be an example to others of how we should live? Should we steal from others? Is it okay to commit adultery? Is it okay to use God's name as a cuss word? You say, of course not. Then why is it okay to break the Sabbath? because it's a part of the same law. And as James 2.10 says, if you break one, you're guilty of breaking them all. The law of God is like a chain. When one link is broken, it ruins the whole thing. If our hearts have truly been renewed by the Holy Spirit, 
the law of God will be carried out in the life, don't you think? And if the law is written in the heart, won't it shape the life? Yes. Obedience to God is the service of love for what he has done for us. 1 John 5, 3 says, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And chapter 2, 4 says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And so, instead of releasing us from obedience, it's faith that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which then enables us to render acceptable obedience. And so I just want to make it clear that we do not earn salvation by our obedience, because salvation is the free gift of God, which is received by faith. But obedience is the fruit of saving faith. And Jesus said, you shall know them by their what? By their fruits. To put it in today's language, we would say you shall know whether or not a person is truly a Christian by the way they live and whether or not they obey what I have said. When the Sabbath Sunday issue is considered today, many people say that Sunday keeping has been a custom in the church for many centuries. And this is true. It's been a custom for over 1,500 years. But the observance of the Sabbath is much older than that because it's as old as the world itself. And according to Bible chronology, is close to 6,000 years old. So if we're going to go by which custom is older, we should keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. And not only that, but the Sabbath institution was ordained by divine authority, and that can't be said about Sunday unless one considers the authority of the Pope of Rome to be above the authority of God, which is ridiculous on its face, at least to those who believe the Bible above church tradition. When you think about it, it's only been a couple hundred years since the forgotten Sabbath truth was brought to the attention of the world in a big way during the mid-1800s. And so one can understand that to overcome Sunday tradition and custom and help people understand that the Sabbath has been usurped by the devil is a tall order to accomplish. But something is going to happen one day very soon to bring this issue to the front when a Sunday law is introduced and finally enforced on pain of death. And as it goes viral on the internet and the news and talked about and debated in the churches and at the kitchen table, people are going to have to decide for or against it. The God of heaven is not going to allow people to go blindfold into hell. Everyone is going to have the opportunity to make an intelligent decision for or against the Sabbath truth. Because the God of heaven is loving and fair and just, no one is going to be made to suffer the wrath of God until the truth about this issue has been brought home to their mind and conscience and has been rejected. It's just like James 4.17 says, To him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. There are many millions of people who have never had the opportunity to hear the truth about this subject. And the obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in a way that they can understand. And here's the thing. God will leave no one who really desires a knowledge of the truth to be deceived as to the issues of this controversy. The death decree spoken of in Revelation 13, 15 is not going to be urged upon people without them knowing what they should do. But whether or not they do it is another thing. But everyone is going to have sufficient light to make their decision intelligently because that's the way a loving God does things. And guess what? Just like in ages past, the proclamation of a truth that exposes and reproves the sins and errors of the people is going to excite opposition. You can't get around it. People are easily offended today, aren't they? We see it all the time with those who are trying to normalize sin. And as people see that they can't maintain their position from the scriptures, guess what they're going to do? 
They're going to attack the character and motives of those who stand in defense of unpopular truth. Remember what wicked Ahab said to Elijah after three and a half years of drought? He blamed Elijah as the troubler of Israel rather than himself, didn't he? Also, Jeremiah was called a traitor and the Apostle Paul a polluter of the temple. So we shouldn't be surprised to see the same kind of thing happen when the Sabbath becomes a worldwide issue. Isn't it true that in a spiritual sense, there have always been just two groups in this world? There are those who serve God and those who serve Him not. There are sheep and there are goats. There are the wise virgins and the foolish. There are the saved and the lost. There are the righteous and the wicked. There are the wheat and the tares, and the list goes on and on. And when it comes to the Sabbath Sunday issue, it isn't going to be any different. Even within the professed remnant church today, there are two groups. And in the end, everyone will have to make up their mind which group they're going to be in. Before we close, I want to take a couple minutes and talk to you about the Pope's weekly Earth Sabbath movement. Go online and type in www.earthsabbath.world and read about it for yourself. This was inspired and outlined in Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. Here's what it says on the weekly Earth Sabbath movement website. Quote, Participants can choose any day of the week to observe the Earth Sabbath, depending on personal or cultural preferences, making it a flexible and adaptable practice. Now that sounds just wonderful, doesn't it? No pressure. Keep any day you want for now. But that will soon change. Because what day do you suppose the Pope is pushing? Sunday, of course. If you are at all in doubt about this, let me read you point 237 in the Pope's encyclical or the official papal letter that he sent out to all the bishops. Quote, On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. The law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day, so that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your maidservant and the stranger may be refreshed. Exodus 23:12. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest, centered on the Eucharist, Sunday, sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. This all sounds a lot like the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, where they encourage a day of rest of one's own choosing, but then they say it necessarily defaults to Sunday. Is it just me? Or do you also think all these different movements and projects sound eerily similar and have one master mind behind it all? I'll let you decide. But I know one thing. Voluntary cooperation is the way tyranny has historically always started out. But then as more and more people and nations sign on to whatever the tyrant is pushing to save the world, then all who refuse compliance will first be visited with civil penalties and finally declared to be deserving of death. So one thing is certain. As you walk by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when God has said stay away and you start listening to the serpent, it never ends well. Just ask Adam and Eve. Friends, we are living at the time of the end. Or should I say at the end of of the time of the end. The handwriting is on the wall for all who have eyes to see and ears to hear. 
Loving Father in heaven, the words we have read are very serious. And decisions like we must make in these last days are not easy ones to make. But Lord, I pray that you would give us courage and fortitude to do what we know we must do. Thank you for people like the Waldenses who copied the scriptures and spread them out like the leaves of autumn as they went their various ways. Lord, you have called us to be repairers of the breach and the restorers of paths to dwell in. The same paths that faithful souls in the past trod. Thank you for a knowledge of the truth. Thank you for giving us a work to do in these last days. And when the latter rain is poured out upon us, help us to be able to receive a large supply so that we can give this last message of mercy to the world with great power. Please send the Holy Spirit to convict each heart this morning and help us to be faithful to the trust you've given us in proclaiming this last message. We look forward to the day when you will come and we want our loved ones and our family members and those for whom we have labored to be ready for that great day. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.